It's the weekend and you have financial questions that need answering. That can only mean one thing. It's time for Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Uh, another day, another show, another weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. It's Jill on Money. Very happy that you are with us. Very happy that you have decided to spend this time. We really never take you for granted because you are the reason that we exist. And that's why we want to hear from you. Part of this program is predicated on the idea that you like listening to questions from each other and you have financial questions that you want to ask. So if you fall into that category, why not? send us a quick note. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And uh, hopefully we'll get you on the air, which would be so much fun. And if it's uh, detailed, maybe just give us a little background about yourself. It would help us out. And we would be delighted. I am a certified financial planner. I'm actually the senior CFP board ambassador. Mark, are you almost done with your last CFP class? So Mark is months away. By the end of the summer, you will have cre- you will have completed all seven of the modules. What do they call them these days? I don't know if they're sections, modules of the certified financial planners kind of the the predicate to taking the big test. Mark wants to know if I ever saw this coming. Hmm. No, um, I, I didn't know that. But, you know, it is so to me, it's like so funny because you're you're so curious in general that it doesn't surprise me that you're doing it. Uh, if you want to find out about how you can become a CFP, you can just go to the website CFP dot net. That's the one. To, that'll tell you how to become a CFP professional, and it will give you links to education partners, um, and and especially. And I know we have a lot of people who listen to the program who work for financial companies, so this is a great place to find out more about the CFP certification and why I like it so much. So I think that that to me it's a it is a gold standard. It's not the only, but it is a gold standard. I think it's well worth doing if you're in the business. So um, go check it out. Okay. Now, let us get to you and your questions. So right now, it's Alan who's in Florida. Where in Florida, Alan? Lake Worth. Nice. How's the weather? Great. Yeah, of course. Why would it be bad? You had a beautiful winter. We had a horrible winter. Are you a former New Yorker? Yes. I knew that because Mark and I said... Uh, we, we just like sort of guessed it. And, and now I heard two words come out of your mouth and now I know you're one of us. So do you miss New York? No. (laughs) Nothing about New York? Uh, Just family. Ah, all right. Fair enough. Well, uh, tell me what I can do for you today. I just read your article, which I read all the time and I like what you said and I had a question and I really didn't expect to be on the radio. I thought maybe I would get a written answer from you. Well, isn't it more fun? I like to talk to you. You know, my mother likes to say, I want to hear your voice. So what's going on? How can I help you? Well, I own about 80% of my portfolio is with one stock. What stock? MCO. That sounds like Moody's to me, right? Yes. Uh Uh-huh. 80% of your whole portfolio is in one stock. Did you work at Moody's? No, I worked for Dun & Bradstreet, which at that time owned Moody's. Aha. Uh-huh. And so is this all the stock you own, is this in a retirement or a non-retirement account? Non-retirement account. So I presume you've owned it for quite some time, and you probably have a very low cost basis. Is that a good guess? Yes. What's the cost basis on the stock? I just looked the stock up for, for the heck of it right now. It looks like it's trading about 167, 168. What what do you think your cost basis is? About fifty five. No. Okay. So you got eighty percent of your money, all of your money, in this one stock. Uh how you how do you survive right now? Do you live off your dividends? Do you have social no, security? No, not yet. <laughs> now what I do whenever I Need money. What I do is 
you know, I have a few other stocks which make up a small portion of the portfolio, like portfolio and, you know, I sell some of those stocks. Uh-huh, uh-huh. More, more mutual funds. So are you managing your own money or are you working, are you working with somebody? No, no, I'm managing my own money. So what do you think about this? Uh, what are you going to do? I mean, this is a pretty big bet to put on one big company. Do you get nervous about it? How old are you? Over 75. Okay. No, I don't get nervous over it. You don't? <laughs> no. Well, okay, because you're not because you don't need to live on it right this second, I presume. Right, right. And the total portfolio value is how much? Between like 4 and 8 million. 4 and 8 million, okay. Um but you don't really need the money and you, are you married? Do you have kids? What's the story? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Kids okay? Kids doing okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you ever gift money to these kids? Do you gift stock? Do you do anything like are you charitable? Yes. How do you do how do you do your charitable giving? Just write a check or do you gift stock? No, I write a check. Okay. First things first. So here's what I'm presuming. I'm presuming that someone's saying to you you should sell the stock. Uh, of course, if you sell the stock, you're going to get hammered with um, with capital, capital gains. gains. It's it, which is not the worst thing in the world. I mean, capital you're you're probably the highest is 23.8 percent. It's not the worst thing. Um, I want to just tell you one. There is one technique that people can use if you really want to get rid of this stock. You'd have to talk to someone who knows what they're doing about it. But uh, there is something called a collar like a dog collar. Um, and uh, this is a way that many folks who own highly appreciated stock, uh, they lock in their unrealized gains and uh, they defer their capital gains tax to the future. So that's one thing to do. It's, it's a somewhat complicated. The other thing that I think might be interesting for you to do is to use this highly appreciated stock and use it, number one, to take a, uh, you know, to, to basically gift it to charities. Because when you gift stock as a charitable donation, then you essentially are able to not have to pay capital gains. So whatever checks you're writing for charities, stop doing that. Use your moody stock as your charitable giving. And finally, if you do decide to start to diversify, I mean, I'm all for it. It's just a question of whether you can suck it up and pay the capital gains. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. But, of course, if you die and you never sold a share of the stock, the kids will get the stepped up cost basis. So if it's not keeping you up at night, if... You're not worried about it. I'd be worried about it. I would I would definitely say you should sell it. But if you're not going to sell it, start using it to gift. And more importantly, uh, don't be afraid of paying some capital gains. Not the worst thing in the world. So thank you so much for calling. You're listening to Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, 855-411-JILL. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Back to Jill on Money with Jill Schlesinger. Have a question? Call or email anytime. 855-411-JILL or ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. You're back with Jill on Money. We love to get you on the air. We love to hear your voices. We like to hear your questions, your comments. And the best way to get in touch with us is to email us. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. And that way we can uh, help you out. Today, right this minute, we've got Linda, who's on the line from the Bay Area. Hello, Linda. Welcome to the show. What can I do for you? Hi, Jill. I have a question. Sure. Um, my husband recently inherited a variable, non-qualified annuity, and they gave us a whole bunch of options, but they didn't want to explain the options. <laughs> so I thought I'd give you a call. 
<laughs> well, doesn't that make you want to do business with that company? Not really. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, okay. So here's my question for you. How much money is in the annuity? About $54,000. Did they tell you um, what the, I think that you would, you have, you have to pay tax on this, I think, because it hasn't been taxed yet. That's right. They so what's the tax cost, the cost basis? Cost. Yeah. Uh, 32500 All right. So there's not a big tax bill due, so that's good. So that um, means I would I would pay like on twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, taxes. yeah, cut twenty two grand, um, and it. The thing is, so let me ask you something. The. Tell me what your what your situation is. Let's start there. Tell me about you know how what do you need this money immediately or not? Um, my husband, and I don't need the money immediately, but my sister-in-law does. Oh. We'd like to have her pay off her condo. She is not listed on the annuity at all as a beneficiary. Hmm. But we would like to get this, um, you know, at least half of this money to her. Um, okay. She's on disability right now, and we'd want to help her out. Hmm. If okay. it was, you know, if it was up to me, I would have structured the whole thing differently and had everything go to her because, you know, her tax basis is a lot lower than ours. Right. Right. Um and I asked them if I could do that, and they said no. That so they didn't explain why or how. Or... Yeah. Well, okay. Wait a second. So I, I, I don't. I think that what you have to pay on the gain is not capital gains. I think it's ordinary income. That's what. That's my guess. So I think. So how much money do you and your husband make together? About two hundred thousand. Okay. Um. Okay. Um, and will, so they will not let you take a partial distribution is what I'm hearing. Is that correct? Right. Well, they will let me take a five-year deferral, mm. but I'm worried that my husband and I keep making more and more money right. in the next couple of years. So you might uh, – so you might – well, so – all right. So look, you're in the 24 percent tax bracket. You'll stay in the 24 percent tax bracket because you said you make 200 and that bracket goes up to like 315. So – and then I'm still in California, which is the high. Oh, I know, well. I know. So, but still, you know what I would do? Take the money out. Mm -hmm. Take the whole thing. All right. I just take it. It's going to be a pain in the tush <laughs> to deal with I this. I agree. So you are going. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to take the money out. You're going to have another twenty two thousand dollars of taxable income this year. But you get your, your fifty four thousand. You'll account for this. Just leave a little extra oh, money, joy. right? You know, I'm yeah. sorry. And um, and cut a check to your sister in law. Um, wait a second. So tell me about your sister in law, though, because what I think you're going to have to do is you're going to how what is she? Where is she living right now? She lives near us. Uh, in the Bay area. She lives on her own, though. Yes. Okay. If if you. Cut a check for fifteen grand to her right now, um, as a gift. There will be no problem, right? So that may be well, what I was I... just planning on. Since um, my husband is the executor of this state, and my mother-in-law's name was on the um, loan to her condo, mm -hmm. just paying that off. Perfect, perfect. That's even it's better. Directly a to the yes, it's a direct. The... If you make a that is actually a better. I was going to ask you if you can directly start to address some things because then you won't have to worry about gift taxes. So absolutely, I think that's a great idea. And uh, how much is her mortgage that remains? About sixty thousand. All right. So that'll whittle away a good chunk of it. And is she going to receive other money from the um, estate? We're planning on using that to help pay off that. That condo. Okay. And what about you? Are you going to receive other money from the estate as well? It was a very small estate, so um, just a little bit, not a whole lot. Okay. I mean, you could you could also, if you wanted to, I don't know how you want to do like even Steven or whether, you, you know, there, there are ways to help her out. But the, the best way to help her out, obviously, considering that you guys have, you know, a, a good income, is to make direct payments where you can. That will very much alleviate the problems for her um, in terms of like longer term, as opposed to like just throwing cash at her and having money that's available. I think that's a better idea, the way that you're planning. Yeah, to do no, it. We're, we're, we're not going to yeah, throw the cash. We're just uh, planning on 
paying off. Good. Um, Perfect. The, the house, and then the house that my mother-in-law had was going to rent out, so then she has to make cut. Okay, that sounds good. All right, take the money. I know. Just hold your nose, pay the taxes, and get it over with. And, you know, it's just so frustrating when they give you all these choices they don't explain any of them. When you call them up, they say they can't talk to you about it. You know, they can't really tell you how much it is for sure. Yeah. You know, this is one of the problems with insurance companies in general, which is, you know, they some of their products are really important. Term life insurance. Of course, you don't need anyone to explain that to you because it's so simple. <laughs> you just get it. Yeah. But they're complicated products that, that they have created, and you would think – that at the very least, they're amazing salespeople usually. And so what they usually do is they'll try to upsell you. But uh, having someone provide zero assistance makes your um, makes all of your decisions a lot easier. Thank you very much. Well, I, I don't think I would have bought anything from them anyway. Good, so. good, good. Excellent. Anything else going on in your financial life I can help you out with? Well, my husband and I are doing pretty good. So we're, we're very happy and blessed. Great. But, uh, I just want to take care of other people. So. Yeah, good for you. Well, you're a very nice sister-in-law, and your husband's a good brother. And um, good luck to you. I hope they get the money and, and you know, pay the taxes. Move on. Well, I feel a lot better talking to you. Thank you very much you for take your advice. Pleasure. Take care. Um, you know, one of the problems with these annuities, yet again, is that everyone tells you they're so tax efficient, they're this, that, and the other thing. What if the mother had just bought a mutual fund with her money? And then what would happen is all the accumulation of that mutual fund upon her death would get a step up in cost basis. Instead, you've got to now saddle your kids with an income tax liability. What a pain in the neck. This is so funny, by the way. I just, I see this, um, I just was on a insurance company's website just looking at some funny things. It says, committed to you, financial professionals. Yeah, you're committed to me, all right. Uh, when you're being sold any product, whether it's insurance, an annuity, um, maybe a complicated real estate investment, anything like that, if you don't understand it, then don't buy it. And... This is not to say, look, you can have a very risky investment and you can still do it, you know, and just as long as you know, okay, well, I'm going to lose all my money or I'm going to make a bunch of money. Okay, that's different. That's a lottery ticket. But if you're trying to figure out whether to use something to accumulate wealth, it's a little bit different. So that being said, um, careful out there. There are no guarantees, but there may be better options for you. You know, it's one thing to take a flyer on a high-risk investment that's just very easy to understand. Oh, I'm going to buy a stock. Okay, can I afford to lose this money or not? Yes, no. Another thing to say, think that you're saving money and doing something great for your kids when it might be more complicated than that. Okay, you're listening to Jill on Money. Our phone number is 855-411-JILL. Our email address, askjill at jillonmoney.com. We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You are back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. 855-411-JILL. Send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Hey, Mark, how's the newsletter doing, man? Is it good? You feeling good? You getting any good feedback on it? No feedback? Hmm. Getting some subscribers. Would you like to uh, subscribe to our free, did I say free, newsletter? Uh, just go to JillOnMoney.com, our website, and you can subscribe there. This is where we curate good stuff, not just our own stuff, other stuff too. So uh, make sure that you check that out. It's like a in case you missed it kind of thing. All right? Very good then. Uh, this is from Anonymous. 
Uh, Anonymous says, wants to know, is it does it make sense for me to convert some of my rollover IRA to a Roth IRA? I have substantial enough retirement savings to be able to do it. I wonder if the tax savings would benefit me. I'm in the 15 percent tax bracket currently. I mean, if you're in the 15 percent tax bracket, mm, that sounds good. Now, I wonder what tax bracket uh, Anonymous is going to be in in 2018 because there is no 15 percent tax bracket. I wonder if Anonymous goes down to, is it 12 percent? or goes up to 22%. That is what I don't know. So, hmm, okay. If you're in the 12%, um, she's thinking about converting $20,000 and has a Roth with 200 grand in it. Uh, I don't know. I think that it's probably not a bad idea to convert if you're in a low tax bracket. And certainly a 12%, if, you know, again, I don't, I don't know exactly what the number is, but right now if you're single... For this year, 2018, if you make between $38,701 up to $82,500, you're in the 22% tax bracket. So if you can stay in that 20, um, if you can stay in that 22%, then by converting, maybe it's not a terrible idea, but the 12% is up to 38.7. So I don't know if you'll be able to do it. You might be popping yourself up to the 22%. I'm not sure. So, yeah, you can do partial rollover. uh, Sorry, you can do partial conversions, uh, but you really just want to do that as long as you stay in the low tax bracket. The other question that Anonymous has, who is 70 years old, what's the best thing to invest in a Roth account? I can't even answer that. I mean, it depends on what's going on. The best thing to do is to have a diversified portfolio. But, uh, you know, I don't know what else is going on. So I need more info. Have Anonymous Give us a holler back, okay? All right. Uh, John says he's got uh, one year to retirement, and he's got an actively managed account uh, at Schwab. He pays a half a percent in management fees. He thinks he pays about $11,000 annually. Should I take the accounts over myself to save? I don't know. How good an advisor are you? I mean, do you think it's worth it to have... That mu- that I mean, it's probably not that they're going to like kick butt and deliver better returns, but that may stop you from doing something dumb. So my answer to that is if you have an eleven thousand dollar insurance policy that prevents you from doing something dumb, that makes sense. If you essentially are a passive investor, you use index funds and you don't need advice and you don't need anything, then uh, fire them and take it back over yourself. It seems reasonable. Okay. Uh, Here's a listener uh, from Seattle who has listened to uh, my interviews with Dave Ross on Cairo Radio during the week and uh, was so happy to learn that we have our own show. Woo! Okay. So I have $200,000 in a traditional IRA. My income is too high for a Roth. I have five hundred fifty thousand dollars in a four hundred one k. I have a hundred grand in emergency reserves, five hundred fifty grand equity in my home. I save eight thousand dollars a month. In hmm, ah, I get it. I save eight thousand dollars each month between his four hundred one k and personal saving. I have a few expensive hobbies: airplanes. <laughs> And rebuilding collecting car collectors' cars. I earn two hundred sixty five thousand dollars a year, uh, with a higher maybe a potential of maybe ten to seventy thousand dollars a year more. I'm fifty four, single, no kids, forced retirement age at sixty five. I'm aggress- I'm invested in aggressive mutual funds and dividend paying stocks. Am I missing anything from my planning? What else should I be doing to prepare for the forced impending retirement in eleven years? Um, I mean, I get that you're an aggressive investor. I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, I, what you're going to find now if you start listening to the show is you will see that I'm a huge wimp. So I wouldn't mind if, uh, especially as interest rates are rising over the next few years, that you take some of the money out of the aggressive portfolio and shift it into a more 
balanced approach with some bonds. And I would especially do this inside of the retirement account because the income that those bonds produce would not be taxable to you. So that may be something to consider. Then uh, I guess the other part of this is just run some retirement calculations. Go see if you've got, you know, you got enough money to live the life you want to live. It sounds like you do. Uh, I, I've had a, we have a lot of calculators that are out there. There's a one, there's one paid calculator that I w- would like to uh, tell you guys about. I, I think I've mentioned it before, but I like it a lot. I went back and played with it recently. Uh, and it's called esplanner.com, esplanner.com. I like that one too. So uh, it's on our resources page at jillonmoney.com, Mark says. So uh, anyway, I, I think it's always good to know what these numbers are. That's the most important part of this, that, you know, in order to figure out the best investment strategy, sometimes you have to go backwards and say, wait a minute, where do I stand overall? And then what is the investment strategy that's going to get me there? Doesn't that make more sense than sort of flying blind? I think so. Anyway, thank you very much for writing. And if you've got a financial question, we always love to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Askjill at jillonmoney.com. And follow us on Twitter at jillonmoney. We're way over 15,000. I notice we have 15 one. <laughs> All right. After the break, more of your questions. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. She's all over the place. Yes, she is. Oh, gosh. How you doing? Everything's good here. You're back with Jill on Money. This is the program that takes the mystery out of your financial life. I'm Jill Schlesinger, also known as the CBS News Business Analyst, but more importantly, known as the Senior Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards Ambassador, CFP Board. Hey, cool things happening over at the CFP Board. Check them out. Let's make a plan. Dot org. Is it dot org? Did I mess it up? I think it's dot org. Okay. Uh, okay, let's... Uh, do some questions here. If you've got a financial question, shoot us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. Marcia writes that her husband turned 70 in March. He's going to be required to take required minimum distributions from his Roth IRAs. Uh, no, he's not. You don't have to take RMDs from a Roth. So if that is a typo and you meant to say traditional IRA then I'll deal with that. But let me just be clear. Roth IRAs do not have any required minimum distribution. None. That's one of the beautiful aspects of a Roth. You control whether or not you need to take money out. So if these are Roth IRAs, you do not have to take a distribution. Okay, let's pretend that these are traditional IRAs or uh, a, a rollover IRA, or an old retirement account kicking around something, somewhere. Let's just pretend that for a second. And both of them are retired. And Marsha writes, we don't need the money for living expenses. What are our options? Um, okay. The options are, if you are taking a, a distribution, you do actually have to take that distribution. There's no way to defer the taxation from that if you're taking, if you get a check that is cut to you. So it's required, you pay tax on it, and you could reinvest it if you wanted to after you paid the tax. However, let me also remind you that if you have a required minimum distribution from a retirement account, you could actually do something called a qualified charitable distribution. See how I said that slowly? That's to emphasize that this is very important. A QCD, qualified charitable distribution. 
you can make a qualified charitable distribution of up to $100,000 directly from your IRA to a public charity, not a private foundation, not to a charitable supporting organization or a donor advised fund. It has to go directly to a public charity. And when you do that, you don't have to include the distribution in your retirement, in your taxable income. How great is that? It's actually one of my favorite things that's out there that very few people use. Now, if you do use it, remember, you are essentially swapping your ability to deduct a charitable contribution, right? You don't get to do that. So if you're, that might be a good idea, especially if, you know, all of a sudden you're no longer itemizing. So that is one way to sidestep paying taxes. You don't have to claim the income on the required minimum distribution. In essence, you just sort of push it over to a charity and you don't get the charitable contribution, but you don't pay tax on it. So I hope that helps. I think that there's a bit of confusion, So, but I think you're in good shape, Marsha. That's, that's a good question to have. We've gotten a few questions about uh, tax season. Uh, one here from Julie, who uh, sh- this year she and her husband owe taxes. They claim zero for withholding. And she's wondering about uh, what she should do about having an employer take out additional taxes. Also the same with Michelle. She said that she paid about 1400 bucks in income tax. And she said it's the first time she had to pay. She says, I feel like I should adjust my withholding. But I'm hesitant about making any changes to my withholding because I don't know how the new tax law will affect us next year. So this is what I would like to say. Um, In each of these cases, you really should go to irs.gov, okay, irs.gov, and go to the withholding calculator. And that way you can get a better sense of how much you should or should not be withholding. And it's a it's really terrific because it, it will give you an idea. And, and you know, it, it asks you a number of questions. Are, you know, you're single. Can someone claim you as a dependent? And then it goes through and asks you a number of questions. And are you taking certain credits? Do you have earned income tax credits? And all it's like a, a bunch of different questions. So go through and check this. Uh, check your withholding currently. Um We had Ed Slott, the IRA expert and CPA on the program, and one of the things that he did note is that for at least the 2018 tax year this year, you might want to err on the side of over withholding rather than under withholding because we just don't know. I guess it's a little different if you live in a no tax state like Florida, no income tax state or Washington state. But clearly, if you live in a high tax state and you've got a mortgage and you are using state and local tax deductions, that's an area where you want to kind of be careful. So give that irs.gov. Maybe we should put the withholding calculator on the resource page, Mark. I think that makes sense. That's, uh, yeah, do that. That's a good thing. Uh, So, and if you want more resources, sometimes when we talk about stuff, we just pop it in the website. That website is called... Amazingly, JillOnMoney.com, just like the radio show is called JillOnMoney.com. Hey, while you're there and you're running through your calculators, why don't you sign up for our free newsletter? It goes out every Friday. It's fabulous. Okay, when we return, more of your questions. Our email address is AskJill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is askjill at jillonmoney.com. Owen writes, it would be great to illustrate some examples as to what is the difference between the fiduciary rule, which is what is in the client's best interest, versus a suitability. I've had I have read several articles on the new rules, but no one has provided some hypothetical examples. I bet you would be good at this. Thanks. Okay, Owen, think about this. Let's say that Mark, the producer, walks into a broker's office and the broker's managing some money for him. And he says, I want to open up a 529 account for my niece. Okay, fine. 
He says, what should I do? And the broker says, hey, you know what you should do? You should open up a 529 plan in some state. Let's just throw a state out there. But it's not the state where Mark resides, New York. And in essence, the advice to open a 529 plan in another state is suitable for Mark and his request. In other words, he has been told something. He's, you know, he, the, the guy knows him. He knows his client. He knows what Mark's, you know, general investment outlook is. He knows what his general financial life looks like. Sure, go ahead. You can make some, you can make a gift into that 529 for your niece. But he doesn't have to tell him a, the best 529 plan for him. So in the case of Mark, what a fiduciary would say is what you should do and the cheapest, best, most efficient option for you, Mark, is to choose the New York State 529 plan and to buy that directly yourself because you'll get a tax deduction for doing it and it will be the cheapest way to do it. In, one, in the first example, the advice is suitable, but maybe the broker doesn't mention I get paid a commission from this. It's buried in some document. And in the latter, the best interest of the customer or client comes first. So hopefully that helps. Okay, when we return, we are going to do our great interview for now. This is Jill on Money. Give us a holler at askjill at jillonmoney.com and hop on over to the website, jillonmoney.com. You can actually get our free newsletter. Comes out every Friday. Okay, we'll be right back. It's the weekend, and that can only mean one thing. You're listening to Jill on Money, the show that takes the mystery out of your finances. Here's your host, Jill Schlesinger. Well, well, it's hour number two, and we are so delighted to have a really interesting guest today. His name is David Pilling. He is an editor at the Financial Times. He's reported from all over the world. But more interestingly, he's just written a book called The Growth Delusion, Wealth, Poverty, and the Well-Being of Nations. I was interested in this because so often, you know, every month I report on the national measure or scorecard of the economy, the GDP, the gross domestic product. And according to David, uh, the GDP has an interesting history, and I learned a lot from this interview. So uh, without further ado, let's get going and talk to David Pilling. David, every month, people like me or folks in your newspaper will report on this statistic that's called GDP or gross domestic product. And it is uh, essentially a measure that we always will say, like uh, kind of like a scorecard on the economy. So I was hoping we could start by understanding where where and when did GDP begin and how did it become what you call a proxy for a country's well-being? I think that's a very good question. Uh, I mean, we tend to think of GDP, um, which is really a synonymous or has become synonymous with the economy and with um, something that we call growth. Um, as almost like a natural phenomenon, you know, just like we measure height or the mass of a mountain, then we measure the health of an economy through GDP. But GDP is actually a relatively modern invention invented in the United States uh, in the 1930s, uh, first of all, as a, as a sort of a remedy or, or in answer to some of the questions posed by the Wall Street crash and the Great Recession. And FDR wanted to know what had happened to the economy. But there was no real way of measuring it. Um, and so Simon Kuznets, um, uh, who was a, um, an expert economist, somebody who was um, very familiar with data, crunching data, went around the country and came up with this measure, um, which has sort of become consolidated, partly because of um, its birth uh, at that sort of momentous moment. It then became very important in the Second World War. And then after the Allied victory, it was really rolled out as part of the Marshall Plan. It was then adopted by the Russians and the Chinese. And everybody has sort of adopted the same scorecard. 
Um, but it's my contention, and, and it, it, indeed it's Simon Kuznets, it's inventor's uh, contention, that GDP only tells you a limited uh, amount of things and that we shouldn't ever really equate it with well-being. And that's something that I would say that we've fallen into the trap of doing. You you mentioned early in the book, which I found kind of interesting, it kind of when you just put it out there, it sort of it says that um, sometimes it, it really gives you this very skewed way of thinking about the economy. So, for example, if I make something and I do, you know, for example, I go I, I, I put a product out there, it's included in GDP. But if I go volunteer, that means nothing is it in terms of the economy. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. I mean, there are all sorts of problems with GDP. One of them is it only measures, as you say, transacted um, uh, you know, goods or services. So in Britain, although funny enough, not in America, we measure um, hard drugs, heroin, crack cocaine and prostitution. So the more of those activities, the better for our GDP. Now, very few people in Britain know that, but that's in GDP. That speaks, I think, to a broader point, which is that GDP measures everything. It doesn't measure only things that are good or that we might value. It measures all um, activity for which money changes hand. So, you know, the bigger your health service, which might mean the more expensive your health service, um, the more that contributes to GDP. And the more your production and the more you pollute and then clean up the pollution and the more that contributes to GDP. So I think the, one of the first things that it's important to realize is that is that when we talk about the economy growing and growth being up, um, what we are talking about is everything. Um, and that may be all sorts of good things that, that, we've, uh, that we're making more of. But it could be all sorts of bad things or indifferent things. Yeah, you call it in your chapter the good, the bad, and the invisible. And I thought, and that was interesting in that um, in that chapter. It seems to me a lot of what women are sort of doing as their second full time jobs, like caring for kids and taking care of the you know most per- highest percentage of household chores, is actually not counted as a contributing to growth at all. And that's the it's and I not, feel like that's the invisible right there, right? Well that that is your invisible. It's not part of the economy. So anything that's done in the home is is not part of the economy. So if you look after an aging relative, you are not contributing to the economy. You're doing nothing for growth. Um, though of course you are doing something for society. However, if you send your aging relative to a, 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 an old person's home and pay for them to be looked after by somebody else, then hey presto, that is part of the economy. That strikes me as um, slightly odd and counterintuitive, and yet that is that is what we what we're in fact measuring. Can I just go back with a quick question? Is that before GDP was invented in the 30s, how did we talk about the economy? What did that mean? I'm not sure it meant uh, an awful lot. I mean, in America, um, you know, when uh, when Roosevelt wanted this, uh, you know, this measure of the economy, he was relying on things like freight car loadings. The stock market was in a bad way. Unemployment was clearly up. There were crude measures of production. And there had been attempts um, actually throughout history um, in uh, in Britain and in France to measure, uh, for example, land and the the wealth that that that, um, land or the income that that land could generate through, you know, crops and animals. And so you could argue that the doomsday book um, was a sort of an early crude attempt to measure, uh, in fact, the stock of wealth hmm. and how much land was there in Britain and how much income could be thrown off that and therefore how much could the government tax it. So uh, our attempt to measure the economy is often linked with our ability to tax. And in fact, that's one of the reasons I think that GDP has persisted as a measure because it is a good proxy of tax. If you know your economy is 100 then you kind of know, well, we can get 30 as a government in tax or 20 if you're a small government or 40 or 50 if you're, you know, a Scandinavian government. But it gives you a kind of uh, um, a benchmark of the size of the taxable economy. And, of course, you can't tax someone looking after their aging relative. You can't tax somebody um, painting next door neighbor's house uh, for free. Um, And there's all sorts of things that, that lie out side of the taxable economy. And it's interesting that this is now a sort of moving target because as we move from analog to digital, 
There are all sorts of things that used to be part of the economy, things like travel agents, uh, things like tagging your bags in an airport that used to be done by somebody else. But they've now been outsourced, and they've been outsourced, in effect, to you, um, the, uh, the consumer. And so they've moved from part of the economy um, to part of household, what, what economists call household production. Um, this measure that was born in the manufacturing age is becoming, I'm not saying it's not useful at all, but it's becoming less useful and more questionable as our economies change. Okay, we'll get back to our conversation with David Pilling in just a second. You're listening to Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, she's all over the place. Go to JillOnMoney.com to find it all. Now back to the show with Jill Schlesinger. Yes, we are all over the place. And that is primarily because of Mark Talercio, the best executive producer of all. My sister asked me a question. She's like, what happens when you get like a negative comment? Do you like, have to respond to it? Do you have to do anything? And I said, well, I don't know. Let me ask Mark. Because he will not share with me the negative... Con- so, well, I think constructive criticism is different than a really nasty note. So I am th- amazingly thin skin for someone who's in the public. And we learned a long time ago not to engage with people who are very nasty. So we don't do that either. Anyway, uh, we digress. If you do want to read up on stuff that we are doing, hop onto the website, jillonmoney.com. You can subscribe to our free newsletter, which is uh, comes out every Friday. And uh, you can poke through and see what's going on, videos, TV appearances, etc. Right now, let's get back to our interview with David Pilling. We're talking about how you actually measure what is uh, counted as something that contributes to economic growth. And that's really a fascinating question in an era where service dominates goods. So here's more of our interview with David Pilling. If I am using a free service free in terms of monetary free Mm -hmm. facebook or twitter my using that is not measured but their ability to monetize it is measured as part of gdp is that correct it is yeah it's measured in terms of the advertising they get um, or the data uh, that they sell what are we missing in gdp now as we move from analog to digital well there are things so for example let's take the example of something in Britain, uh, I presume you had it in America as well, called the Encyclopedia Britannica. So there was a book with all sorts of knowledge in it. In fact, it was many, many volumes. Um, In order to produce that book, you would have to chop down trees. You would have to set up a printing press. You would have to send people around in vans with books to sell that book. It used to be sold door to door famously. Now we have um, information, in fact, most of human information available to most people, anybody with access to the internet for free, and we call it Wikipedia. That has really supplanted the Encyclopedia Britannica almost entirely. Um, The Encyclopedia Britannica used to contribute to GDP. Wikipedia doesn't contribute at all. Uh, It's a free service. Um, And so uh, things can sort of drop out of GDP. I mean, one of the things that we think about or that we think our economic measures tell us is innovation. Surely um, it captures innovation. And yet it doesn't really. If you think about an antibiotic, say, 200 years ago, and a billionaire 200 years ago might have paid half his or her fortune for a, um, a course of antibiotics because it would have saved their lives. Today, antibiotics cost pennies. They, they virtually don't contribute to GDP at all. So you can see how that kind of innovation sort of slips out of the way that we, that we measure. I mean, that could mean that in some ways we're better off than our economic statistics uh, would lead us to believe. You also say that it's sort of like you can also have almost like a double counting, right? Because if I'm if I'm booking my trip while I'm at work, it sort of reminds me of learn uh, of, of attorneys here. All this they're billing more hours than there are in the week, right? <laughs> than they, than it's possible. So we can't double count, right? But we are 
spending time doing stuff that may not be productive. I don't know. Maybe it is productive, but it, not in my life, at least. I guess that productivity is a whole different measure anyway. does Do the two intersect in any way, the productivity well, and GDP? So. I mean, it could be that one of the mysteries of our supposedly flattening productivity is that we're just not measuring it correctly. I mean, that's not something that I take on head on in the book, but certainly some of the questions I raise um, might mean that we're um, that we're failing to capture um, uh, certain efficiencies uh, in the economy because they're in a sense sort of uh, dropping out of the economy. And you mentioned double counting, and I think that's actually kind of interesting because one of one of my points actually, uh, and the sort of strong points I make in the book, is that we take our measure of the economy ex- extraordinarily seriously. And yet, at its inception, when Kuznets was thinking about what should be in the economy and what should not, there were all sorts of questions. And Kuznets, in fact, wanted to take many things out. So, for example, he wanted to take out what I suppose today we would call banking. And he called it sort of financial speculation because he, he saw that as double counting and in that a bank's function or one of a bank's main function is to allocate capital. So it allocates capital to, you know, a maker of steel or a maker of widgets. Um, and it picks winners in a sense. And mm. that, that's the efficiencies that a, that a good banking system is meant to bring to an economy. But should you count that? Should you Because it's sort of already counted. So, for example, when you have a loaf of bread, uh, you don't count the entire loaf of bread as contributing to GDP because what you say is that the flour that went into um, the bread has already been counted and the wheat that already went into the flour has already been counted and the light that went in to make the bread. So you could say we shouldn't count banking services because that's already counted in our final production. And yet, just before the financial crash in Britain and America, banking was seen to be contributing a large slice of GDP, up to 10% of GDP. And I would argue anyway that we were that that's precisely what we did. We were double counting and we were giving, in a sense, too much credence mm. to um, the banking sector by seeing it as a productive activity in its own right, rather than seeing it as an ideally an input um, into you know, w- what is our economy. But it's not an economic activity that we should necessarily value in its own right, particularly not when you know, the banking industry was getting up to some of the things that it was getting up into, you know, in the run up to the financial crisis. So I I guess that the other point being that as we move from a manufacturing to a service economy, whether it's in Britain or, you know, industrial Europe goes into service and certainly here in the United States, how does that impact GDP? Well, I think hugely. Um, growth is good. I'm sorry, GDP is good at measuring things we can drop on our foot. Or as someone said to me recently, things you can put in a wheelbarrow. You know, you can count steel bars. Uh, you can count tables and chairs, houses. It's very hard to count many of the things that make up our modern economies. And services, after all, contribute about 80% um, to our modern economies. But to work out the contribution of computer services or a haircut, or landscape gardening, or psychoanalysis, or a concerto, it's very difficult. Because in order to do that, you really need to make some judgment about the quality. Um, you have the price, but if the price decreases or, um, uh, or increases uh, in the following year, what does that t- tell you about the productivity, about how much more of that service you're producing? So for example, if you take a computer, and let's say a laptop costs a thousand dollars, and then the next year it costs a thousand dollars, but the laptop is much faster and it has better screen resolution. It can do much more. Then, in fact, the price of that laptop has gone down, and 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 so economists try to adjust for that, and um, and nas- you know national statisticians try to adjust for that. But that's very hard to do when you come to sort of less tangible services. You know, let's take an extreme, a psychoanalysis session or, as I said, a philharmonic orchestra. I mean, how do you improve the productivity of a philharmonic orchestra? You have to get it to play at twice the speed, you know, (laughs) Beethoven. Then the productivity's gone up. And then it becomes all the more complicated when you're trying to make cross-border comparisons between, say, the United States economy and Britain's and Germany's and Japan's. So how do you compare a train service in Japan versus a train service in the United States? Now, both will appear in GDP, But it's my contention that that doesn't actually tell you anything very meaningful because the most meaningful thing about the train service is the quality. 
the um, the number of seconds delay on the service, the comfort of the seats, the quality of the food served, the pleasantness of the surroundings. Now, none of that is captured in GDP, and yet in services, that is really that that's the bottom line of what it is that we're consuming. Um, so, I think that the more our economies move from manufacturing um, to intangible goods and services the less adequate our main measure of our um, of the health of our national economies um, becomes useful we'll get back to our interview with david pilling he's the author of the growth delusion wealth poverty and the well-being of nations while we're during doing our break, uh, why don't you just hop on to the website, jillonmoney.com, and there you can check out some shows that maybe you missed in the last few weeks. It's Jill on Money. We'll be right back. Follow Jill on Twitter and Instagram for more personal finance content. Just use the handle at Jill on Money. Now, back to the show. You're back with Jill on Money. If you've got a financial question, maybe it has to do with housing. I've been getting a lot of questions about uh, mortgages and refinancing, so we'll, we'll have to start dealing with some of those. Uh, and, by the way, 30-year mortgage rates popping up. Popping up. Like, I think they ended April at like an average of 4.7% for a 30-year fixed. So if you didn't refinance, that's a bummer. Uh, if you're buying a new house, hopefully you're making a lot of money. That that would be a good thing. Or as my mother likes to say, rich or poor, I'd rather have money. Um, anyway, uh, what we want to be able to do today is to determine your your well-being. How are you? How is this economy doing? And for that, we have a really interesting guest. His name is David Pilling. Not only does he have a cool British accent, which always sounds classier than us, uh, but he's really smart and he has done some fascinating research about what a GDP, gross domestic product, or other measures of the economy can really tell us about our well-being. So here is more of our interview with David Pilling. You know, part of your subtitle is the well-being of nations. And I think that part of your thesis is essentially that we have this thing, this thing we call GDP, which you know is always expanding because if it's not getting bigger, it's not better. But it does not tell you about the well-being of an individual. That seems to me the greatest flaw. I, and I'm now like, I have to say, I'm sitting here, I'm interviewing you. I read your book and I literally thought to myself, I have to stop reporting on GDP. This is not. I mean, I really did because I, this is crazy because it does not really tell you much in many ways. Well, that's right. I mean, look, economists would say, and I think with some justification, look, it's not meant to tell you about well-being. I suppose what I think that is in our common parlance in the kind of public debate, we've sort of elided those two concepts. Mm -hmm. Kuznets has warned very strongly against that. But I think that we've done that. You can't imagine a politician saying, you know, I'm going to improve your well-being, but the economy might suffer a bit. Those, those things are sort of, you know, it, it, that does not equate really in, in the public discourse. And yet it could perhaps. I mean, it's easy to to increase the size of our economy. It's very easy. We could all work twice twice the amount of time. We could all, you know, you could ban um, Sundays and, and call that a working day. I mean, that's more or less what has been done in, say, a, a place like Korea, South Korea, um, which has very good GDP, and and, and I'm not um, um, negating the kind of exceptional progress that, that South Korea has made, but some of it is just made by you know an awful lot of work um, and, and people just putting in uh, huge amounts of hours. You know, Keynes thought that we'd all be working 15 hours uh, a week by now, whereas in fact what we sort of find is we're working harder and harder and harder, and keeping on a on this sort of treadmill to keep ahead to pay our mortgage, to pay school fees, to pay health insurance. And, you know, we're meant to be five, six, seven times wealthier than our grandparents were. But it doesn't feel like that. And I think it doesn't feel like that for a very real reason, because to some extent, we're measuring the wrong thing. We've talked about 
this number, but the other number that that does start to talk about well-being is household income and middle class wages. And I know in the UK, you know, sort of the predicate of the Brexit vote and here in the United States, the 2016 election, that many people were saying, you know, maybe this has changed a bit in, say, the last year and a half or so, that that essentially wages for those in the middle have been frozen where they were, you know, assuming inflation for 20 years, so maybe even down a little decades, bit. Even longer. Mm. I mean, in the United States, there's some numbers I've seen that suggest that median household income got stuck uh, in sort of at 1970s level. And, and, and uh, particularly, I think, for, um, uh, you know, those who haven't graduated from higher education, from college. Um, and I think that's right. And I mean, some of this, I think, is not rocket science. You know, I think that we could have uh, you know, we don't need sort of complicated indexes necessary to replace GDP or, or to accompany GDP. Something like median household income, I think, would be a useful accompaniment. And if you imagine, you know, a politician saying, I'm not going to grow the economy 3%, but I'm going to increase median household income. That doesn't sound very, it doesn't exactly sort of trip off the tongue. But what it would mean is, you know, the typical person's earnings. That would, I think, be a lot more meaningful because if all the growth that we're meant to get excited about is going to a sort of a narrow um, segment of the population, then what, what is all that growth for? GDP is not a phony statistic. It's just come to mean more than it was initially meant to measure. So you have skepticism about right. what it is, right, and what it's being used for. I think that's right. I mean, I think one of what, what, what you know one of the reasons for my book really is so that when you hear you know GDP has gone up to two point three percent, you should kind of a, a, a bell should go off in your head and you should think yes, but you know I know what that tells me. I also know what it doesn't tell me, and so that we can look at some other numbers. You know, you already mentioned median household income. You know, there may be other um, numbers that we want to give um, certain weight to, which I would say at the moment kind of get drowned out because we have a hierarchy of numbers and in that hierarchy, GDP is king. And and so in addition to median income, uh, you also mentioned GDP per capita because that then actually takes into account uh, how much the population is growing. I mean, lud- ludicrously, ludicrously simple. And you might, and I sort of, uh, in the book, I joked that I was embarrassed to bring up this um, this idea so late in the book. But I lived in Japan um, where routinely people asked me what, where Japan had gone wrong, what was the problem, you know, its economy wasn't growing, what was, what was up. But if you did a, a simple GDP per capita calculation um, on, um, uh, on Japanese income, it was rising just as fast as Britain at the time. Now, this was in the early 2000s. And, um, you know, Britain then was meant to be the kind of golden boy economy. It was doing really well, partly because of deregulation and, you know, it's motoring ahead. And Japan was a basket case. And yet, if you perform the simple um, uh, arithmetic of dividing uh, GDP by the number of people in the country, um, because Britain's population was growing faster, Japan's has sort of stagnated and is now in, indeed shrinking a little bit. And that may not be healthy in and of itself, but... Um, but as far as individual Japanese are concerned, their individual uh, income was going up just as fast as, uh, as income in Britain. And yet, you know, a crude assessment of the economy didn't tell you that. We'll be back after a quick break to talk more with David Pilling. His book is called The Growth Delusion, Wealth, Poverty and the Well-Being of Nations. If you've got a financial question, we'd love to hear from you. Just send us an email. Ask Jill at JillOnMoney.com. We'll be right back. If you've missed any part of the show or want to check out a past show, go to JillOnMoney.com for more great personal finance content. You're back with Jill on Money. Our phone number is 855-411-JILL. See, I did it really fast, Mark, so no one calls. Are we still getting a lot of calls? More emails. Good. We like emails better. Do you know why? Because you don't give us all of the information, really, when you call. It's usually that you kind of, we like to start with at least an email giving us some background. So send us an email at askjill at jillonmoney.com. Hey, what what makes you feel good? What What is a good indicator of your overall well-being? 
there's lots of different factors, right? And that's why our guest, David Pilling, is really interested in these this the the way that we measure uh, the overall well-being of a nation, right? Because it's not just the total of the goods and services that are spent in a given year. It has to be more than that, right? What I find interesting about that is it, it is really a, a, a great way to think about our own financial lives and our own lives. It's not just about money. There are other factors that are really important. So let's get back to more of our interview with David Pilling. His book is called The Growth Delusion. You also talk about a new metric that I've always been very drawn to, this idea of a well-being index of some sort. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, you can cut that many ways. Um, You know, I I do have a certain skepticism, but I mean, I wanted to cover this uh, in the book. And um, there were there are certain there are, there are different things you could do. One is you can just actually ask people, and it sounds ridiculous, but you can ask people, how happy do you feel? How content are you with your life? And they've been doing this in Europe for about forty years, and it's on a scale of one to ten. And um, there are a number of kind of cross checks on these numbers that show that they're rather more robust than you might think. And so, for example, um, they they did uh, there was a study that showed um, these results of what you might call, you know, sort of self-assessed happiness um, and election results uh, versus uh, the state of the economy as measured by GDP and election results. We were always told it's the economy stupid. If the economy is going well, then, um, you know, then, a, then an incumbent party is likely to be re-elected. But this study anyway showed that it was a closer correlation between assessed, um, sort of self-assessed well-being. You know, if you felt happy, you're more likely to vote for the party in power. So sort of well-being as measured or uh, by, um, the, by people in question. There are, there are completely different sort of methods of doing this as well. For example, there's one that's used in Maryland. Um, there's another in Canada where at, at the outset you sort of determine what is it we want from our society. You might want to preserve the environment. You know, so if, if you build over a wetland, then you would get some GDP because you built a shopping mall that's generating income and jobs, but you'd lose something because you've, um, you know, paved over a natural resource. And if your air quality goes down, you would take something off to account for that. And if everyone's working much, much harder to produce the same GDP, you'd take something off for that. And if crime shoots up, um, if jobs become more precarious. So there are a number of kind of criteria um, and then you, you know, you have something. I mean, in Maryland, they call it the Genuine Progress Index, and I think it's a very interesting. It's, it, it sort of it, it prompts a political debate about what actually is it that we want, what is all this growth for, what are we striving for, um, and people can then judge um, the results of this index against, you know, what's, that, what's actually happening, and see if it's, you know, measuring things according to how the world feels. And the complicated thing in that is that is how do you weight these things? So mm. how do you weight you know, a destroyed wetland versus a 2% increase in wages. Um, and in a sense, these things become impossible. So you have an index with a, and a number that comes out at the end, but you could be arguing for hours about what that number is telling you. And so one of the things about GDP, although it, it is an index in and of itself, but at least it's simple. There's a number that we can all agree on. This means that. Um, but I would also like us to know it doesn't mean this. Right. So at least we ought to be aware of what it can tell us and what it can't. Before we go, David, I was just wondering, because you have lived all over the world, right? Uh, so mm. you lived in Chile and Argentina and Tokyo and Hong Kong and now back in London. So of all those places where you've gone through up cycles and down cycles, was there one place where you felt that people were like the well-being was more consistently better than another? And why do you think that is? Um, well, if you, I mean, as you've mentioned those places, look, I wouldn't want to romanticize Japan. Uh, Japanese society has many uh, things uh, wrong with it. But uh, there were definitely things that were good about Japanese society that were simply not being captured uh, in, the, in the normal numbers. So Japanese crime rates are extremely low. The number of people in prison uh, extremely low low um, for those who have good jobs, and that's not everybody and increasingly not everybody, but for those who have good jobs, it's sort of, you know, a real security, um, very little uh, notion that you're going to be hired and fired. 
um, health um, and exceptionally good. So the Japanese um, live probably, I think, when I was there, maybe four years longer than Americans, and their healthy life expectancy was was higher still. Again, you know, nowhere else is that does that figure um, uh, in GDP. Even when their economy was, you know, sort of flatlining, and everyone was saying they're a basket case, their unemployment was extremely low. Um, so Japan was was a place, um, and there are a number of caveats. And I wrote very critical articles about Japan, so I wouldn't want you to think I didn't. But Japan was a place where I felt that, um, you know, as a society, it had sort of ridden out um, a cycle that, GD- that GDP would tell you they were in you know, sort of a disastrous state. Well, thanks so much to David Pilling. His book is The Growth Delusion, Wealth, Poverty, and the Well-Being of Nations. If you want more information about that, just go to the show notes at jillonmoney.com. Mark has all the links that you need to buy the book. All right, when we return, one last segment, a quick question. We'll be right back. You're back with Jill on Money. And before we wrap up the program, I just wanted to get to a Twitter question that we uh, received. If you want to follow us, just go to Twitter. Be sure to change your password. Uh, And we're at Jill on Money. That's our handle. So David writes, uh, a younger family member is getting a degree in financial planning. He's looking for a relevant summer job that isn't isn't an unpaid internship, i.e. he wants to get paid. Any suggestions on types of jobs he could get now that would help with an entry-level search later? He says, bank teller? I mean, look, anything in financial services, I think that, I I don't even know if there are that many bank teller possibilities that exist anymore. But that being said, you know, anything that he would be able to even just, you know, kind of get coffee in an office of a financial planning firm would really be helpful. Um, and that may mean doing uh, some work for a big wirehouse, one of the big companies you've heard for, heard of. And the the other idea might be to see if in your, since you sound older, in your network of people, do you know financial people who can just talk to him and talk to, uh, you know, say, Hey, you know what? My son or my nephew is is going through this. Uh, any open jobs? He'll do anything. He'll get you coffee. He'll make copies. I don't even know if they make copies anymore. This is is I'm really sounding old, but uh, you know, like one of the jobs I had, I just leveraged the fact that my dad was in the business, and I I literally stood in the back of a booth at the American Stock Exchange making photocopies of buy and sell orders, which were written tickets. Then I would take those copies I, and, and I would file them and I would take the originals, roll them up and put it in a pneumonic. Uh, is that pneumatic or pneumonic? Pneumatic tube that went to a back room where they recorded the trades. That was my job. I was essentially like Lucy and Ethel on the candy, um, you know, when they're put, putting the candies into the boxes. I would. That's how it would always happen really fast and I'd get really stressed out about it. But You know what? It got me on the floor of a major exchange, got me exposed to that. So that was pretty cool. Uh, Also, by the way, just go to uh, the CFP.net. Maybe in your area there's a CFP who wants some help this summer. Okay, good luck. Thank you for writing, David. And thank you all for listening. It's been a great show. Thanks to David Pilling, the author of The Growth Delusion. For more of our shows, just go to our website, jillonmoney.com, while you're there. Sign up for our free newsletter. Thanks so much for listening, and we will talk to you next week. Have a good week.